Welcome to the Consumer Corner. This is a podcast that focuses on protecting the consumer from corporate America. One of the things we're going to talk about is different companies and how they've harmed consumers. Sometimes these stories will be newsworthy. You may have heard of them. Other times they might fly under the radar a little bit, so to speak. In today's episode, we will look at Portfolio Recovery Associates and the scandals that have uh, embarrassed it over the years. We will also talk about some of the things they're doing today, right this minute, to harm you, the consumer. Some American companies are causing more harm than good to their consumers. In fact, I would say today most companies are, at least the bigger ones. Uh, smaller companies, not so much. We represent a lot of smaller folks, and they're, they're generally good people. But when they get big, uh, it seems like things just go south. Many of these companies guarantee uh, some sort of consumer satisfaction. Promise them good service, assure them of loyalty, and then bind them into a contract. They bleed them with fees, and they cheat them with fine print. Obviously, many consumers end up becoming victims. Uh, according to an article uh, written by Gail McGovern uh, and Young, Young Me Moon, if I'm saying that correctly, back in 2007, it was titled Companies and the Customers Who Hate Them. And they explain that, uh, quote, some companies consciously and cynically exploit customers uh, in this way, um, end quote. Uh, but in our conversations with dozens of executives in various industries, they found that the majority of firms that profit from their consumers' confusion have unwittingly fallen, fallen into a trap. Without uh, ever making a deliberate decision to do so, they have, over a period of years, taken greater advantage greater advantage, sorry, of their customers. Uh, a company is less likely to help customers make good choices if it knows that it can generate more profits when they make poor ones. Many firms, companies have discovered just how profitable pen penalties can be. As a result, they have an incentive to encourage their customers to incur them, or at least not to discourage them from doing so. An example of this will be your, your credit card late fees. You're usually paying a um, significantly higher interest rate uh, on credit cards, and you, you pay that regardless of when you make your payment. So as long as there's a balance on that credit card, for the most part, with the exception of maybe the first 30 days, you're getting charged super high interest, maybe upwards of 30%, maybe more for some folks. But they'll charge a late fee if you're one or two days late on making your payment. What's interesting is it doesn't cost them any money. They could let that balance sit there and run and run, and the interest is going up. So they're still making money off of you, but they as sort of to, to kind of kick you while you're down. They charge you a late fee. Um, doesn't seem fair, and they don't really have any incentive to stop you from making the late fee because they love it. It's, it's pure profit for them. Um, and a lot of companies w want to make money, you know, without really considering how it will affect the consumers. They're unconcerned with the, the dissatisfaction of consumers as long as they're generating b big profits. I, I feel that's getting a lot worse now, given the pandemic, that um, companies are fine just making money and not delivering anything. They're just, you know, it's the pandemic, it's COVID, we can't deliver. Well, you, it wasn't a problem, you took my money, but it's a problem when you deliver what you promised. Um, and where's this loyalty they preach? So let's take a look at... Portfolio Recovery Associates, also known as PRA. That's what I kind of refer to them as usually. Sometimes I refer to them as portfolio. There's quite a few debt collectors that, that use portfolio in their name, uh, but I use when I, when I use the word portfolio, I'm usually talking about PRA and Portfolio Recovery Associates. So we're going to take a look at how their actions have caused harm to their alleged customers. So Portfolio Recovery Associates was founded in 1996, it's one of the largest collection agencies in the United States. And what they do is they, they buy collection accounts. They buy accounts primarily from credit card issuers, uh, Synchrony Bank, and, um, a lot of the other uh, original creditors, I call them, um, with credit cards. When, when, when folks can't pay, uh, those, those credit cards get, uh, get charged off. Those accounts get charged off. And at some point, companies like Portfolio, maybe some others too, but will buy them, um, buy them in mass. Uh, thousands of accounts at a time, and they pay you know maybe four percent, maybe less uh, of, the, of the amount due. So if you owe a dollar, they might pay a nickel, four, four cents or a nickel, maybe maybe less. Like I said, um, 
And of course, they're going to try to attempt to collect the balance of that account. So for every four cents they spend, they're going to try to collect a dollar. It's a pretty good profit margin. Uh, they also buy uh, debts that were owed by consumers who, who filed bankruptcy recently. One thing I've noticed is whenever someone files a bankruptcy, almost immediately the, the accounts get sold. Um, I won't say immediately, but as quick as they can, those accounts seem to get sold to debt buyers, which is interesting because if the person gets a discharge, those debts are not collectible. They can't collect those debts. Um, if it's a, like a, depending on the type of bankruptcy that is, I guess. Um, so the chance of them making money on, at that point is, is super low. Um, it'd be interesting to see if they pay less for those accounts. I'm sure they have to, but um, many people get letters from portfolio or calls from them and they, they think they're a scam because they sound like you've never heard of the name before. You had, you knew about a synchrony bank account. Maybe it was, it was a Walmart card or something like that. And that's this person from portfolios calling you and, and demanding money. And it sounds like a scam. They seem to change their numbers too, which is, kind of indicative of some of the robocallers now and the the other fraud that's going on. But that name is actually, it's, it's, it's a real debt collection agency. They're licensed in, in certain states that require that. Um, they're actually the, the second largest debt buyer in the U.S. Um, they're very, I guess they'd be described as a very aggressive debt collection company, to put it nicely. They claim, uh, from what I've seen, they, they, they try to buy or they claim to buy directly from original creditors, um, which I guess their, their theory is that makes the account fresher, if you will. Um, what happens a lot of times is when these accounts, when, when one debt buyer can't make any progress and get blood out of the turnip, they'll sell that account to someone else who will also try to get blood from the turnip. And, of course, the price and value goes down as it goes on, and the, the documentation gets sparser and sparser. So by the fourth or fifth debt buyer, you've really got nothing. I think 60 Minutes did an episode, and you were able to buy accounts on a USB drive from somebody out of the trunk of his car or something. It was really shady. Um, but they claim to try to get them from the original credit. I don't know. I can't recall if I've ever seen them on a case where they've had uh, they've been the second or third debt buyer in line. I think everyone's, from what I can tell, they've been the first. But that's just my experience. I, I could be wrong. Um, but they claim to... to to buy directly from original creditors, which should make their, their accounts, or at least their documentation, better. Um, bar is still pretty low, and they don't have much, but that's what they claim to do. And in these, these scenarios, the creditor, Synchrony Bank or whoever's selling it, uh, I'm just using them as an example. There's a bunch of them that sell to them. But uh, they benefit by getting a little small percentage, you know, like I said, 4 or 5% of the, the, the face value of the delinquent account. You got to remember that the creditor has already written that off, so they consider it a, uh, a valueless asset, if you will. They they don't treat it as, as money coming in, and so when someone offers them four percent, that's four percent on nothing. That's that's pretty good, um, at least from a numbers perspective. Uh, and portfolio, of course, makes their profit by trying to collect the full amount, you know, hundred percent of if if not more, because sometimes they'll start adding their own interests or, or their own late fees. I haven't seen late fees too much at least not continuously. I've seen one or two late fees added on, but uh, sometimes they try to add interest. Um, they also try to add interest to the, the full amount when you're trying to get a judgment, which is a little suspect. Um, but they try to at least get the full amount uh, from, from the person's name who's on the account. I would say the owner, but it's not always the owner. Sometimes it's the wrong person. Many times I would say it's, it's the wrong person, um, which is part of the reason they weren't paying the original creditor. Uh, but this is why they have to put, uh, you know, really an intense and aggressive effort into collecting this money is because they, they bought the account and, and no one was paying on it before. So it's not like they got a good account. They got something that was already already in trouble. Um, let's talk about some complaints a little bit. Now, despite laws to protect the consumer, such as the FDCPA, uh, commonly uh, referred to as the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, Portfolio Recovery Associates... Is, is, they're still involved in very aggressive actions uh, and make use, I would say, of illegal tactics to harass consumers. Uh, there's quite a few lawsuits and complaints with the Better Business Bureau and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also known as the CFPB. According to the CFPB, uh, as one example, somebody complained about their communication tactics. And I've kind of seen this uh, a little bit, not specifically like this, but I've seen some strange things 
on the phone with them. Um, they'll call, according to this person, they called multiple times a day, every single day for the entirety of the day uh, from dozens of numbers after being repeatedly told to stop. Um, says she couldn't even use her phone for legitimate purposes. Um, other complaints include collecting a debt the consumer didn't owe, other general harassment, uh, also impersonating an attorney, law enforcement, or other government official. This harassing uh, behavior is not really new. Um, in 2011, uh, according to the PACER, which is your public access to court electronic records, basically it's a big um, called like e-file, electronic filing. It's records of all the, the court cases that have been filed in federal court. Uh, PRA was sued hundreds of times for harassing consumers under the FDCPA. Uh, it's a, so many times a year they get sued for the FDCPA. Sometimes individual suits, sometimes it's class actions. Uh, there was a period I was probably filing uh, several times a year for sure. Um, and and I'm, I certainly don't run a mill. There's quite a few mills out there that just they, they file suit every day, all day against Portfolio Recovery Associates and some of the other ones too, not, not just them. But um, according to the, the CFPB, more than 11,000 complaints were filed between July 2013 and J January 2014. Uh, that's, if I do my math, it's like six months, seven months against uh, was various debt collection companies, but also included Portfolio Recovery Associates. So that's not, that's not all portfolio, but quite a few of them probably are. According to, to Weston Legal, um, PRA ranked third for having the most complaints, uh, which they're the second largest. So that, that makes sense. Um, I think Encore Capital is number one. And they're actually a conglomeration kind of of Midland Funding and Midland Credit Management asset acceptance. So they, they probably eat up one and two together since most folks don't know that they're they're kind of separate. Um but on September 9th, 2015, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau took action against PRA. They were found guilty or liable, or I'm not sure what, what the right word is. They were, um, what the, the appropriate word is anyway, but uh, found liable for buying debts without verifying the purchase um, as it lacked documentation, was inaccurate or unenforceable. They collected payments from consumers using false statements and unverified court documents. Uh, according to the CFPB, Richard um, Cordray, Portfolio Recovery Associates threatened and deceived consumers to collect on debts they should have known were inaccurate or had other problems. Uh, he said now that the two biggest debt buyers in the market must refund millions and overhaul their practices. That's what he thought anyway. Um, he says we'll continue to take action to protect consumers from illegal and obnoxious debt collection practices. Uh, sound, sounds nice and I know they meant well, but I can tell you, I don't, I don't think a lot's changed um, in the industry. They're still doing what they do, and they, they pay the penalty and they move on. Um, I guess they, they kind of got a taste of their own medicine, um, but I, I don't, I don't have a lot of confidence that that really slows them down much. Oh, they did have some problems later with, with money, so maybe, maybe it did hurt them a little bit. Um, but ironically, those that think are called. PRA a scam. They're really not. They're not that wrong. I mean, it is kind of a scam. That's why I hate to say they are. They're not. It really depends on your definition of the word. Um, they're certainly a, a registered business, and they can take your money if you're not careful. Um, but they're they're not they're not good people. Um, and I believe that PRA, with all the experience, should have had been aware or were aware that those deaths were inaccurate, um, as well as the RoboSign documents used. There was. A big issue, and this is industry-wide, it's not just portfolio, but they robo-sign affidavits. So if you ever see a complaint filed by a portfolio against a consumer, to, to, they sue them on, on, on these debts. Um, so basically what happens is when, when, when you don't pay, when they call you and send letters, if you won't pay, they'll sue you. And they'll have these affidavits attached. And most of the attorneys filing for PRA and, and most of the other debt collectors file thousands a year per attorney. So they don't... They're just signing the, the complaint. They don't have time to, to really do much. Um, there, there's certainly no due diligence or anything like that there. Um, and there's there's affidavits also included with these these um, packets that the attorney gets, and we we, we call them robo sign because it's they're they're just signing them and someone's stamping it with a notary stamp. Sometimes sometimes there's no stamp, but. There's been enough depositions now. We know that they, they only look at that for seconds. They don't look at any documents. They don't have any personal knowledge of anything. 
the computer generates the affidavit based on the Excel spreadsheet that has everybody's name on it, and they just they just sign it. It's all it's all fiction. Um, but again, that's an industry wide problem, uh, not just portfolio. Um, but they knew that. They, I mean, they knew that's the case. There's no hiding that. That's part of their business model. Um, their behavior is just deceitful. I mean, as, as they file lawsuits, they did not plan to legitimately pursue um, because they knew the account holders could not or would not defend themselves. This is um, also an industry problem as many of these debt collectors and debt buyers will sue on debts just to get a default judgment. The expectation is, and, and they have to, uh, to plan this way. If you have a thousand, if you file a thousand lawsuits as an attorney and everybody decided they're going to litigate them, that you're done. There's no way you could handle it. Um, so what they do is they, they file a thousand and 95 to 98 percent don't even get an answer. No one files an answer. So after 30 days, well, it depends on your jurisdiction, but in, in Georgia, for example, you got 30 days usually and no answers filed in 30 days. Um, They'll wait two more weeks to, to make sure probably, but sometime after that they're going to file um, either motion for default or they're going to have the court schedule a hearing or just sign off on, on a default judgment, and then they'll start garnishing wages if they can do that and garnishing whatever they can take. Um, but the intent is for nobody to answer. It's it's There's no way if, if, if you file a thousand suits and half of them answered, I mean, that would just be catastrophic to them because they couldn't handle it. So that's their business model. There's no denying that. Um one of the things that they uh, flushed out was um, this PRE really purchasing large debts from original creditors. But some of these debts left out important information. They still do, I think, that the correct, uh, th some of the things that were missing, I guess, were the correct or exact balances and interest rates. Um, many important documents were unavailable. Um, if, you, if you've ever seen a forward flow agreement, they're pretty nasty. And that's basically a, a sales agreement between the creditor and the debt buyer. And it usually says stuff like, you know, you, these, these debts are junk. You can't do anything with them. There, there's no warranty, no guarantees of anything. If you need documents, you're on your own. Sometimes they'll let them get a few documents if they ask for them, but there's a process they have to go through. They're not automatically provided. Um, but irrespective of this, the company proceeded to buy these debts, knowing some of the debts were not the most fresh, if you want to use that word. Uh, they also demanded the wrong amount, added interest rates, and wrong payment due dates on these accounts. Um, they did no investigation, really nothing. Um, this is all done at, probably at worst by a computer, at best maybe a pseudo paralegal who was just you know regurgitating what the computer said. Really, it was all done with a computer. Um, and of course, they also engaged in uh, what I would say is a legal litigation practice. Uh, they sued and harassed consumers in state courts all across the country, knowing these claims could not be proven. Uh, they had no documentation for them. They still don't. Um, and the purpose of these lawsuits was to frighten or intimidate consumers, um, as most of them did not fight back or, or defend the claims, which allowed them to win automatically. Unfortunately, um, I don't know how to use the right words, I guess, but uh, our judicial system did not help the situation. I mean, there, if you go into our small claims courts right now, 90% of the suits filed are either debt collectors or, or dispossessory, as we call those evictions. And they just don't have time to look at these cases, and it's just a, it's a big machine. And many times those courts just assume that the, the bank's right, too, or they think it's a bank. It's, it's not even a bank. It's a debt buyer. And so they, they give deference to those people. Um, sometimes they don't have a choice, and sometimes they do, but they still don't. Um, and so they just, um, they're almost robo-signing the judgments. Um, that's just kind of how the system works, unfortunately. Uh, according to the CFPB, uh, portfolio used affidavits that misrepresented that the affiants had reviewed original account level documentation confirming the consumer's debts when they had not. It's because they don't have any original account level documentation, uh, but the affiants said they did. Well, the document they signed said they did. They didn't even read that document. They were just, based on math, there was no way they had time to read that, um, given the numbers they were signing. Um, they also submitted affidavits with documents attached they claimed were the consumer-specific account contracts or records when they weren't. Uh, I've seen this where, uh, again, it's an industry-wide problem. There will be terms and conditions attached to uh, an affidavit or, or a lawsuit, and they'll later find out that no, that was that was a different time, wasn't wasn't applicable to that account, but they didn't know. Um, 
because they, they don't. They just attach whatever they have to it or whatever they think is appropriate. Um, and these shortcuts allow the companies to churn through these lawsuits without doing any research, due diligence required to obtain uh, a, a legitimate judgment. Um, they, they sent out many letters that contained inaccurate statements and threatened to sue consumers by filing cases that were past the applicable statute of limitations. Um, this means if, if they've got six years to sue you, they might, uh, after the last payment or, or default, uh, they might wait six and a half, seven years. Um, was not uncommon to, to see that. Um, and you would think the judicial system would catch that, but but unfortunately they do not, um, unless you get an attorney and have that attorney represent you. And even then sometimes some of the, the smaller claims courts are so um, so biased towards these debt collectors and debt buyers that they, they still rule in their favor and you end up having to appeal it. Um, but ultimately, usually you'll be successful against them if it's something like a statute of limitations issue, as long as you have an attorney that knows knows your rights. Um, the company also wanted to take, uh, I call it all the money, as they penalized consumers who did uh, not give their consent to receive auto-dialed phone calls. That was a big issue. The Telephone Consumer Protection Act used to be a, a pretty valuable statute for protecting you against... Uh, people at Robo call your phone. It's, it's not as strong now that judicial branch has kind of um, clipped the wings on a little bit, unfortunately, um, so they can, they can kind of Robo call you now in certain conditions. Um, fortunately, the CFPB kind of swooped in. Uh, they took some enforcement action and banned the company for violations of federal consumer financial laws and prohibited the company from reselling debts to other debt collectors. So and they thought they could, they could sell it after, you know, trying to collect for a year or two and they had plans on selling it to someone else. Uh, those those plans were, were killed. Um, they were also asked to pay $19 million in consumer refunds and an $8 million penalty. The company was prohibited from collecting on over $3 million worth of debts. Um, of course, keep keep in mind that's $3 million of probably the face value, so that's really not that much if, if you do like 4% of that or 3% of that, um, which is what they paid for it. Uh, they were required to stop collecting un unsubstantiated debt and filing lawsuits that are unenforceable and incorrect. That, I don't think that's really changed. Um, unfortunately, some of the words they use are pretty weak. Uh, doesn't really mean a lot um, when it comes to enforcement. They are prohibited to, uh, from using affidavits to collect debts unless the statements contained uh, within the affidavits specifically and accurately describe the signer's own personal knowledge of the facts and the documents referenced uh, in the affidavits were attached. That's um, I've uh, there's another debt collector I've de deposed. Well, it's an affiant for one of the other ones that was kind of caught up in the same mess, and uh, that hasn't changed really any. Uh, they just learned to use different words, but nothing's really changed. They're still robo signing stuff. But last but not least, uh, PRA was told to provide consumers with credible, use my air quotes here, credible information and original documents to file a lawsuit or collect the debt, which they should have been doing. Uh, I, I don't think that really means uh, as much as it sounds like it means. But CFPB got a win. They paid some money. I guess some creditor or some, some consumers got some money back. I mean, it's nice to cite those whenever we sue them. We'll, we'll bring up the, uh, I think it was a consent order. Now I've got to look back, look back at it. But um, we'll reference that anytime we sue them or, or defending a case against them about their inaccuracies because um, they'll stand there and tell you how accurate they are and how hard they work and they don't they do anything wrong um, <laughs> there's, uh, it's pretty clear they did and they, they still do but anyway when it rains it pours though um, and it, uh, interestingly enough some good old karma may have come around a little bit on May 12, 2020 a class action lawsuit was filed claiming PRA violated uh, the Warn Act this appears to be, uh, I'm not licensed in, in Nevada, but this is uh, the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. Um, on March 23, 2020, approximately 200 former employees of a regional PRA office in Las Vegas were laid off through an email without being given any notice. According to the WARN Act, companies are required to give employees 60 days notice in advance of any mass layoff. And PRA's defense, they claim to have fired or laid off former employees without notice due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's blame the pandemic for everything. Uh, therefore, it is not a violation uh, of the WARN Act. 
un unclear how they tied those two two thought processes together, but that was their justification. Um, what's interesting is that was that was pretty quick, um, which there may have been some more insight they had later. We'll see. But uh, the former employees countered this by claiming that the the Las Vegas office was not in good shape and was struggling in many ways. Um, they, they insisted the steps were clearly taken by the company that proves PRA was well aware that its Las Vegas office was in bad shape and headed for closure. They said as recently as February 2020, just one month before the mass firing, agents of PRA told Las Vegas office employees hoping to receive raises for their hard work that they would be lucky to have a job at all in the coming months, let alone a raise. Around the, the same time, the workplace being used for the Las Vegas office was allegedly put on the market to be sublet. So clearly, there was a plan in place that did not involve those employees. Uh, but surely it was a pandemic. Sure, whatever. Um, I mean, who would have thought a, a company that buys debts for pennies on the dollar would look for fishy methods to impose power, uh, not only on vulnerable consumers, but also their own employees, um, that's something to keep in mind if you're ever considering working for, for one of those companies, what, what they really think about you. Um, but anyway, as far as what's going on today, nothing's really changed. They're still kind of up to their same old tactics. I don't see them filing as many lawsuits maybe as they used to, uh, but it's not uncommon. Still still seeing quite a few lawsuits from them. I'm not sure um, how bad the, uh, they were hurt by the, the I guess, COVID pandemic or whatever they want to blame it on, but um, they still seem like they're actively uh, going after folks and, and trying to sue them and get default judgment. So nothing's nothing's really changed. Um, you know, if you ever get served one, make sure you reach out to an attorney, see if you can get, get some representation because the system is uh, generally set up in their favor uh, if you're by yourself. So that's a wrap on today's episode. I hope you had a good time listening, maybe learned something. I'm always on the lookout for press releases or other reputable news sources about the misdeeds of this company or really any financial company that is harming consumers. Uh, so, you know, feel free to send those to me. Please leave a review of the episode, too, if you're inclined to do something like that. You can find me on the web at uh, consumercorner.com and uh, cliffcarlsonlaw.com. Sometimes you can find me on Twitter. Um, that's at cliff underscore carlson. You can find us on Facebook uh, at the Consumer Corner or myself at Cliff Carlson Law. You can find me on the, the gram uh, occasionally, Instagram occasionally, cliff.carlson.law. And, of course, if you want to like and subscribe, uh, that would be great uh, so you don't miss out on those future episodes. And, of course, if you, if you like this and you think it's useful and you want to share it with others, that would be great too. Hope you have a wonderful weekend.